Due to the graphic nature of this case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. In the early 1960s, the Kellogg's factory in Battle Creek, Michigan, was one of America's leading manufacturers of breakfast cereal. The factory work wasn't always easy, but the Kellogg's staff was filled with young and fresh-faced employees who were willing to take on the workload. On the morning of January 14, 1963, the Kellogg's workers streamed into the factory. It was early, and some were likely still rubbing the sleep from their eyes when they walked through the factory doors. At least one employee was awake and alert as he glanced through the crowd. His name was Raymond Mercer, and he was waiting for his girlfriend, Daisy, to arrive. But for some reason, Daisy was missing. Raymond and Daisy had been dating long enough for Raymond to know that something was wrong. Daisy was a responsible worker who cared about her job. If she were sick, she would have called in. It wasn't like her to just disappear. Raymond's anxiety only got worse when he ran into Daisy's co-worker and friend, Audrey. Apparently, the pair had a coffee date that morning, but Daisy had never arrived. Raymond and Audrey ran to the Kellogg's parking lot to check for Daisy's car. Then they made calls to see if anyone had heard from her, but no one had. Finally, Raymond realized there was nothing they could do but wait. Daisy would have to show up, eventually. But Raymond never saw Daisy ever again. This is our first episode on Daisy Zick, a 44-year-old factory worker who was brutally murdered in 1963. This week, we'll cover Daisy's early life and the moments leading up to her mysterious death. Next week, we'll cover the investigation and try to piece together who exactly was responsible. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. Daisy Zick was born Daisy Holmes on February 5th, 1919. Her parents, Gaylord and Pearl, owned a farm in Assyria Township, a small town outside of Hastings, Michigan. The family made a decent living, but their world was small. All they had were each other and the desolate farmland that surrounded them. As she grew up, Daisy would pass the days with her sister Dorothy, helping their parents with farm work. But even from her early days, she set her sights on more than just rural life. She started attending school in 1926 and eventually graduated with an 8th grade education. That was an admirable achievement for small-town girls in the early 1930s. Daisy made a few friends at school, but her world remained a small one, at least until she met Bill King. Bill lived less than a mile away from Daisy's farm, but Daisy didn't know him growing up, a testament to just how isolated she was. In 1933, 14-year-old Daisy finally crossed paths with her handsome 22-year-old neighbor, and her life changed forever. Hey, I know you. Aren't you that Holmes girl? Yes, sir. That's me. I remember seeing you out in the fields, but that was a long time ago. You gotta be, what, at least 18 years old? (laughs) I'm only 14. Well, I'll be. You got a real mature way about you. I bet it gets pretty boring holed up at that farm. Sometimes. Why don't you head into the city, then? Plenty going on there. I've always wanted to, but my pa says... (laughs) You're old enough to make up your own mind, aren't you? I got a car. I reckon we could go. Together? Bill swept the young Daisy off her feet almost immediately. The two started seeing each other, and in a matter of months, they were engaged. Daisy's family was shocked by the whirlwind romance, especially since Bill had a bit of a reputation around town for being a loose cannon. But Gaylord and Pearl could see how happy he made their daughter, so they reluctantly gave them their blessing. 
On September 29, 1933, Bill and Daisy were officially married. Shortly after the wedding, the couple moved to Battle Creek, Michigan. With that, Daisy left everything and everyone she knew behind, and all she had was Bill. The newlyweds found a quaint home and started their life together. Bill took a job at the United Steel and Wire Company. It paid around $30 a week, which was plenty at the time. But Daisy's life with Bill turned out to be far from the domestic bliss she had hoped for. After the honeymoon phase faded, Bill's mood soured. It didn't take much for him to lose his temper. He began shouting at Daisy on a regular basis, accusing her of cheating. And then, when things got worse, the abuse turned violent. He reportedly kicked Daisy in the stomach at least once and left bruises on her arms. Then, in 1935, 16-year-old Daisy discovered that she was pregnant. Even this didn't stop Bill's abuse. So Daisy finally left their home in Battle Creek and fled back to her family's farm. But she didn't stay there long. God damn it, Daisy. I told you that boy was no good. You don't know him like I do, Pa. You wouldn't understand. Look at your wrists. You're covered in bruises. What kind of man treats his wife like this? His pregnant wife, for that matter. If only you'd listen to me from the beginning. (laughs) I love him, Pa. Love him, please. Pearl, talk some sense into her. Sweetheart, for the baby, please, just stay here at home. We'll help you raise the little one. We're your family. I, I, I can't. I'm sorry. He's my husband. Daisy couldn't bring herself to leave Bill. She still believed she loved him in spite of his violent outbursts. And besides, she was pregnant and single mothers were far from common in the 1930s. So she returned to Battle Creek, and on April 1st, 1936, her son was born. Daisy and Bill named the boy Jim. But unfortunately, things only got worse after the baby was born. Bill's violent outbursts got even more frequent. One night, he hit Daisy so hard that he broke her nose. It got so bad that even the neighbors started to complain about the constant noise. On one particularly drunken night in 1936, Bill threatened to kill her. And that was enough for Daisy. She packed up her belongings, grabbed her infant son, and stormed out the door. Once again, Daisy headed back to her family's farm. This time for good. Daisy was only 18 years old, But she'd already faced more hardships than most would expect to see in a lifetime. And although she had escaped her abusive situation, Bill wasn't going to let her out of the marriage so easily. One day, when he showed up at Daisy's family farm for his weekly visit to see Jim, Bill discovered that the family was nowhere to be found. So he angrily headed into town, where he thought he might be able to track Daisy down. Damn it, Daisy. You think you can just keep my own flesh and blood away from me like this? Bill, how did you know I was... Stop! Please, just calm down. Let's just talk. The time for talking is over. Now give me my boy. I have a right to see my own son. Hand him over, or I'm heading straight to the courthouse. Now you wait just one goddamn second. That boy might be your son, but he is my grandson. And I am not about to let some liquored-up scoundrel anywhere near him. And if you even think of laying another finger on my daughter... Can it, old man? Now hand him over. Boy, if you don't walk your sorry behind back to that car, I will give you a lick so bad you'll feel it for the rest of your life. You hear me? Well, uh, uh, Yes, sir. And with that, Daisy was finally rid of Bill. Thanks to the protection and support of her family, Daisy was able to push past the trauma of the relationship and began making a new life for herself. A few months later, in 1936, she took a job at the National Biscuit Company, also known as Nabisco, in Battle Creek. Her sister Dorothy also found work in the city, so the pair made a plan to carpool into town every day. But it didn't work out as well as they'd hoped. 
The family may have owned a truck, but the country roads were poorly paved and riddled with potholes. It didn't take long for the sisters to realize that the commute was too hard to do just about every day. Daisy's parents offered to watch Jim at the farm and let Daisy focus on her job. So Daisy and her sister decided to rent an apartment in Battle Creek. Daisy would spend her weeks in Battle Creek and her weekends back home with her son. She settled into a comfortable routine that lasted through the end of the 1930s, at least until World War II turned everything upside down. Coming up, we'll see how the war led Daisy straight into a brand new romance. By the early 1940s, 21-year-old Daisy had already escaped one abusive marriage. She lived in Battle Creek, Michigan during the work week while her parents watched her son. And when the United States entered World War II in December of 1941, her whole life changed once again. The cereal factories in Battle Creek prepared and packaged food for U.S. troops. And a massive influx of soldiers started pouring into Battle Creek from the nearby military training base, Fort Custer. The quiet Michigan city erupted with new faces. The soldiers were looking to mingle, and they set their sights on Daisy. Daisy went out to Battle Creek bars and dances and quickly became a regular member of the city's new nightlife scene. She struck up a number of short-lived romances with various boys from Fort Custer. But there was one soldier who seemed to stand out among the rest. His name was Floyd Zick. Can a soldier buy you a drink? Isn't it usually the other way around? Plus, I'm all set here. Fine, fine. How about a cheers, then? Now that we've gotten to know each other, how about a dance? I came in all the way from Fort Custer. Long way to travel for just a dance or two. Hell, if every girl in here was as pretty as you, I'd come from 10 miles further. Make it 20. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know how to win a girl over. One dance. No funny business. I'm not the joking type. You can call me Floyd. You are? I'm Daisy. Now let's see if you're as good with your feet as you are with your words. Daisy and Floyd hit it off immediately. After a few months, they were madly in love, and they made plans to get married. The next 15 years were among the happiest and most stable of Daisy's entire life. Her son stayed on the farm with Daisy's parents. When he was old enough, he began hitchhiking into Battle Creek every weekend to spend time with Daisy and his new stepfather. Then on Sundays, Daisy would drive him home and have dinner with her family. Floyd had no trouble finding work after the war. He was hired to be the butcher at Fales Market in downtown Battle Creek. It was the perfect place for him. He would greet every customer with a bright, warm smile and fill the market with the sound of the radio, which he always played over the store's sound system. But although Floyd was predominantly an outgoing and friendly man, he was known to be a heavy drinker. And eventually, Daisy's perfect life began to take an ugly turn. Less than 10 years into their marriage, Floyd's drinking created a rift between him and Daisy. He grew more withdrawn, never violent, but his tenderness had hardened into apathy. By the 1950s, Floyd's drinking had gotten so bad that it began to affect his job. It seemed like he might not be able to hang on to his position at Fales Market. The alcoholism was nothing as bad as what she'd endured during her marriage with Bill, but it wasn't the domestic bliss she'd hoped for. Daisy was in her 30s and got plenty of attention from other men. While the years she had spent with Floyd were full of happy memories, Daisy wanted more than just memories. She wanted to be loved. So her eye began to wander. Throughout the 1950s and then into the 60s, Daisy found herself in the middle of a series of affairs with men around Battle Creek. At first, she kept her relationship secret. She would never see more than one man at a time. But over time, she got sloppy or stopped caring. Daisy's own son, Jim, caught his mother with different men on multiple occasions. 
sometimes out in the streets of Battle Creek, and sometimes in their own home. Soon, other people in town started to notice Daisy's ongoing affairs as well. One of Daisy's neighbors was quoted as saying, There's always cars outside the Zick home. And it's no surprise, whatever precautions she exercised during the first few months of her infidelity became a thing of the past. Instead of parking a few blocks away or around the corner, she would park her car right in front of the bars where she would pick up men. It was almost as if she wanted to get caught. Eventually, it seemed as though everyone in Battle Creek knew what she was up to, except her husband Floyd. It didn't help that the citizens of Battle Creek had a tendency to gossip. Her co-workers, neighbors, and even friends were always whispering something behind her back, and then straight to her face. Women began approaching her at bars, angrily questioning Daisy about what she'd been doing with their husbands. Excuse me, miss. Are you Daisy Zick? Maybe I am. What's it to you? You think I don't know what you've been doing with my husband? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, please. You think I've never noticed your car parked around the corner from our house? (laughs) I even recognize your perfume. Well, maybe you should worry more about why your husband feels the need to see another woman, and less about why that woman happens to be me. (sighs) Ah. If you think you can just keep barging into people's lives like this without any consequences... Is there anything else I can help you with? (sighs) Daisy had spent her whole life trying to conform to others' expectations. First on her family's tiny farm, and then in abusive or loveless marriages. Now she was almost 30, and she was finally ready to live the life that she wanted, no matter what anyone else said. And as it turned out, she wasn't the only one who was sleeping around. Seriously, Floyd! You bought that bottle this morning! What? Your other boyfriend's not as thirsty as I am? Jim is right in the kitchen. Lower your voice. And it's not like I'm the only one who's been stepping out. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, please. The girl on Calhoun Street? The whole town knows. (sighs) Whatever. I need another drink. With both Daisy and Floyd involved in their own extramarital affairs, their home became a bleak environment. Daisy tried to fill her life with something to distract her and keep her out of the house. Luckily, her job at the Kellogg Cereal Factory did both. By 1960, Battle Creek had over a dozen companies all attempting to take advantage of the booming breakfast cereal industry. The nearby wheat fields, the Gogwak Plains, helped the industry skyrocket. But among all the competing companies, Kellogg's was by far the most successful and the largest. Daisy worked in the packing department's production line. As boring as that sounds, it wasn't too bad. The role put Daisy right in the middle of the massive facility. It was nearly impossible for anyone in the factory to get through a day without passing by her friendly face at least once. She got along quite well with her co-workers. Most described her as peppy and perky and always willing to strike up a chat or indulge in a bit of workplace gossip. It wasn't long before the other men at Kellogg's started to fall for Daisy's charms. She had a few flings with various fellow employees, but it wasn't until 1961 that things got serious with one of them. Daisy first met Raymond Mercer on the factory floor. What started as an innocent flirtation soon evolved into the pair slipping love letters into one another's lockers after each factory shift. Soon, the two were very much in love, and they weren't afraid to show it. Just about everyone at Kellogg's knew about their relationship. So, you seen the two lovebirds lately? (laughs) Oh my, who? Daisy and the Mercer kid? What was his name? Raymond? I swear, it wasn't a week ago that the two of them were just chatting in the break room, and now it's like they've been hitched for years. Linda said she saw him Frenchin' in the (laughs) restroom. I don't know what you've heard about Daisy, but let me tell you, I'm shocked. The connection with Raymond likely struck Daisy by surprise. 
This wasn't another meaningless affair like she'd become accustomed to. Daisy soon realized that she was committed to Raymond in a deep way, at least when she wasn't at home with her husband. But on January 14, 1963, Raymond Mercer became the last person to speak to Daisy before someone silenced her for good. Next, we'll dive into the morning of Daisy Zick's murder. Now back to the story. By 1963, 44-year-old Daisy Zick found herself stuck in her second unhappy marriage. While her relationship with Floyd Zick was significantly less violent than her first to Bill King, she longed for more. Daisy struck up new and exciting relationships with other men. Some were fellow citizens of Battle Creek, others were co-workers at the Kellogg's factory where she worked, and one of them, Raymond Mercer, finally won her heart for good. Floyd was well aware of Daisy's infidelity. He'd taken up an affair as well. And while this arrangement wasn't quite the normal, socially acceptable version of marriage in the 50s and early 60s, it seemed to work. It allowed the two of them to coexist and maintain a home for Daisy's son, Jim. But on January 14, 1963, whatever stability the Zick household had fell apart completely. The day started out just like any other. Floyd left for work at 7.45 a.m., waking Daisy up on his way out. At 9 a.m., Floyd called to make sure all was well around the house. Minutes after they hung up, Daisy's phone rang again. This time, it was from her lover, Raymond. The two shared a short but affectionate conversation, talking about how excited they were to see one another later that day. That morning, Daisy had plans to meet her friend and co-worker, Audrey Hemminger, for coffee before they headed to the Kellogg's factory together. But when Audrey arrived at the local diner, Daisy was nowhere to be found. Audrey was surprised by Daisy's absence, but she wasn't particularly concerned. Something likely just came up. The cold Michigan winters often caused vehicles to stall, and Audrey assumed that Daisy was just having car troubles. So after waiting for 20 minutes at the diner, Audrey finally gave up and headed into work alone. But once she arrived at the Kellogg's factory, she started to worry. Hey, Sal, I didn't see Daisy's time card when I clocked in this morning. You haven't heard from her, have you? Daisy? No. Come to think of it, I haven't seen her all day. I could ask around for you. Oh, I don't mean to be a bother. It's just... never mind. Is something wrong? Well, it's just that we had plans to meet for coffee at Velo's, and she never showed up. And she isn't here, either. You don't say... If it was another one of the girls, I wouldn't put much thought into it. But Daisy's never missed a shift without putting a call in beforehand. You talked to Ray at all? Uh, the two of them are, uh, you know, maybe he knows something. That's true. I'll go find him. Once Audrey found Raymond, her worries only grew. Raymond said that he talked to Daisy on the phone that morning but he started to suspect that something was wrong. During his break, Raymond rushed out to the parking lot and desperately searched for Daisy's white Pontiac, hoping this was all some sort of misunderstanding, but the car was nowhere to be seen. By this point, it was around 12.30 p.m. Audrey tried calling the Zick home again, but the line rang with no answer. Then she dialed the last person she could think of, Floyd Zick. Lloyd, are you there? It's me, Audrey. Audrey? What is it? You don't sound like yourself. It's Daisy. Daisy? All right, what is it this time? No, no, it's nothing like that. She isn't here. No one knows where she is. What do you mean? Didn't you two get coffee this morning? We were supposed to, but she never showed. No one at Kellogg's has heard from her either. Her car isn't here. Her time card isn't stamped. No one knows anything. It's not like her. Strange. Uh, maybe she just caught a lick of the flu that's going around. Did you call the house? Twice. No one answered. That isn't like her at all. Floyd hung up the phone and immediately left Fales Market. He made his way down Michigan Avenue, 
the road that Daisy drove every day from their home to the factory, searching for any sign of her. When he turned onto Evanston Road, right across the street from the Pine Knoll Golf Course, he saw something that caused him to slam on his brakes. It was Daisy's car, parked haphazardly on the side of the road. The white 1959 Pontiac Bonneville was impossible to mistake. His heart now pounding, Floyd parked and rushed to the car. But when he got to the vehicle, he found it was completely empty. There were no keys in the ignition, and Daisy was nowhere to be seen. By this point, he was a mess of nerves and had awful thoughts flashing through his head. He needed to go home and straighten everything out. But when he pulled up to his home at 100 Juno Street, his fears only intensified. The garage door was left wide open, something that Daisy would absolutely never do. Floyd knew that Daisy was always nervous about intruders. She locked up the house without fail every single time she left. The bad signs didn't end there. The door that led into the kitchen was wide open. And once inside the kitchen, Floyd saw the lunch Daisy had packed for herself still sitting on the kitchen table. Her work shoes were still on the living room floor. Daisy? Daisy, are you home? Are you here? Daisy, don't joke around with me. Where are you? When he got to the bedroom, he found Daisy's purse. Its contents had been spilled all over the carpet. The blankets on the bed were a tangled mess. And when he looked closer, a chill went down Floyd's spine. The duvet cover appeared to be stained with spots of blood. He bolted out of the room to call the police. But then he noticed something that confirmed his worst suspicions. The phone line had been cut. He only had one place left in the house to check, the guest bedroom. As soon as he walked inside, he knew something bad had happened. The room had one closet, and speckling the closet's wooden frame were maroon droplets of blood. Some had made it onto the walls as well. His eyes traveled down the wall to the carpet and landed on a grisly sight. It was his wife's leg irregularly twisted and jutting out from behind the guest bed. As Floyd shakily made his way down to get a better look, he had trouble even recognizing if this was his wife or not. There was so much dried blood that her facial features were difficult to make out. But as he inched closer, he knew it was her. He quietly said her name, shook her limp body, then he placed two fingers on her neck. There was no pulse. Daisy Zick was dead. Thanks again for tuning into Unsolved Murders. We'll be back next Tuesday with part two on the murder of Daisy Zick. 